praise offering this morning. Let's applaud and welcome him into our worship this morning in our hearts. We're so glad to see you today and uh, uh, see some glazed over eyes, some of that nice tryptophan after effects still hanging on in some of you. But I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving holiday and that you had some time to, to be with family and friends and even some time to, to rest and just have a take a breath from the normal uh, hustle and bustle and the busyness of life and, and your schedule. And I hope that you've had that time of refreshing and I hope that you have a great time in worship this morning together as we sing. Uh, Pastor Dan is going to come a little bit later on and share a message. And so we just, we just pray that you would feel welcome here and that you would welcome the Holy Spirit uh, into your life and your presence this morning as we sing that song, Come Lord Jesus. That's not really a Christmas song, but we come into the season of Advent now and it is that season of longing and anticipating the Christmas season and the day of Christmas. And just as the people uh, in his age were waiting for the Messiah to be born, they longed for him. And so we long for him now. We want to gather in his presence and his name this morning. I hope you sense that as we sing together, as we join together. If you're a guest, we're really glad that you're here and, and, and appreciate you coming to, to worship with us today. Maybe you're just passing through town or you're here with family or maybe you just found us today and we're glad, whatever that reason might be. In the bulletin, there's an offer, there's a card there for guests. And if you would like to just share some information, we'd, we'd love to get to know you. And we're not going to bug you or anything like that, but if we can... Uh, communicate with you in any way about something you'd like to know about the church or things, or we can pray for you, that's a great way to do that. After the service, our pastor's going to be back at that table out in the foyer, and if you'd give that card to him, he would love to meet you and talk with you after the service. And so that's a great way to do that and start that, that uh, line of communication. But we're going to, just going to have a great time in worship. We have our night of carols next Sunday night at 6. Our adults, our children, our youth. Yes, hey, we got to go. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Checks in the box for that. Uh, but uh, next Sunday night at 6, we're going to have a night of carols. Our adults, youth, 
uh, children are going to sing some Christmas carols. It's going to be a great night uh, to help you uh, ring in the season. You hear Christmas music everywhere, and we're going to fill up this place with it. So come and be with us as part of that. And uh, you can check out the rest of our holiday schedule for the season uh, on our Facebook page and, and see everything that's going on uh, in the life of the church. But we're glad that you're here today. Turn and shake hands with someone around you. Say hello to them. Greet someone maybe that you don't know. And uh, we're going to continue to sing a couple songs. sing together, come thou long expected Jesus. Christmas songs together. We try to fit them all in here in these next couple of weeks, and so it's always great to just get these in to sing them together. I love this when it has a, a like an extra chorus to it. Just says, "I love you, Lord Jesus. You're the Savior of my heart." Let's sing together. Away in a manger.
with me and pray. Lord, we love you as we sing songs to you. We sing about you, about your birth, about how you came, and we believe that to be true. But we also, I pray that as much as we sing the, the story of your birth, God, that we can sing it with the truth in our hearts that we love you. You're the king of our life. We place you first above everything else. So we bless you as we sing to you in this time of worship. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. As you're seated, we're going to allow our children to go to Kids Stuff. Kids Stuff, this is the last Sunday of November. We're finishing up the Life app of Honor. And uh, our Kids Stuff team is down there. They've been preparing while we've been up here in worship. They've been preparing for weeks for this morning and they'll be sharing some memorable stories, things from the Bible and ways to help the kids get this life app of honor, just not so they just get in their head, but so that they're able to actually apply it in their life so that when you get home, that you sense it and you see it there. It's more important what happens in your home than what happens in that time down there. We hope to just be a Kickstarter for what happens and that you can go and apply that in your life. They can change the world around them. So we pray for our team while they're down there in kid stuff uh, for the rest of our service. Our ushers are going to continue to make their way down. John Fugit, he was on it, man. He was on it this morning. Uh, 
So he was ready to go. Our ushers are going to go ahead and, and make their way down the aisles. The ushers, you guys can come down. We're going to receive our offering for this morning. We're so glad that you're here. After, our, uh, after one more song, uh, Pastor Dan will come and we'll receive, uh, he'll bring our message this morning. Let's pray as we receive our offering. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, this, this weekend that we've had maybe to, to uh, be with family to be with friends, maybe even just to have some quiet time uh, to ourself. And uh, we thank you for all of that. We thank you uh, for, for many things. And as we enter into the Christmas season, may we just continue to be thankful. May we always be thankful. As, you're, as in the Psalms, it said that we enter in your gates with thanksgiving and your, into your courts with praise. May that always be our heart. As we give this morning, Lord Jesus, we, we give... A lot of times at Christmas we think, oh, because Jesus gave us. But we give because you are worthy. You are God alone. And we sing to you. We worship you with our hearts, through our giving, with our minds focused on you as we open up the word. We do all of that because you're worthy. Be blessed in this time as we give. In Jesus' name, amen.
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, for all eternity. Oh, His name shall be. His name shall be. His name shall be. His name shall be. outside Bethlehem this week. I mean complete chaos. I have never seen anything like it before. You see Caesar has issued this decree that everybody must come back to their hometown and be registered for the census. Vendors are selling things like mad. It would take a complete miracle to top what I've seen here in Bethlehem. I mean a complete miracle. Before I get ahead of myself, my name is Stuart and this is my inn, the Bethlehem Bed and Breakfast. We were going to call it the Holiday Inn, but we just never thought it would catch on. It's been quite a night, I tell you. There was this couple that came later on after all the rooms were full. Um, this couple came up, and the girl, she said, Please, sir, do you have any place for us to stay? And I told them, like I've told everybody, I'm sorry, but this inn is full. But she looked at me, and she said, Please, we've been traveling for 85 miles. We are so tired. And my wife, she heard the whole conversation, and she saw something that I didn't see. She saw that this girl was pregnant. And she kind of jabbed me in the gut, and I knew that that meant A, I find them a place to sleep tonight, or B, I find myself a place to sleep tonight, so I chose A. And I told them they could stay in the barn. <sighs> the barn, it is no place for any human to be. I mean, it's full of hay and manure and animals, but that's all I had. And they were thankful. And as they were walking to the barn, the gentleman, I think his name was Joe, he turned around and he said, God bless you. Then he placed his hand on his wife's stomach and he said, because he's about to bless us. You should have seen this couple. There was something so different about them, something amazing. You should have seen the way they treated each other, the way he treated her. The only word that I can describe it is um, a word we don't even use that much, but it's the only word that I can think of, holy. I, I know it's an odd word, but, but you should have seen them. They were just set apart. There was just something different about them. You know what? It's just too hard to describe. Uh, describe your rooms for me, please. Pardon me? Your rooms. I need a place to stay tonight. I'm sorry, but all my rooms are full. There is no vacancies here. Oh, you're telling me. This whole census thing. I mean, I wasn't even going to come, but then my CPA said I had to, so here I am. Well, you're out of luck here, sir. Oh, you come on. you got to have something. I mean, I got money, and I know I didn't misread the sign. Sign? What are you talking about? I turned the vacancy sign off about half an hour ago. No, no, not that. Uh, the, the star over there, you know? I, I've been following that star for like a half an hour, you know? I mean, I just knew it meant vacancies. Apparently, it meant unvacancies. I mean, that star there, you can't deny it. It's shining right over your inn. Ah, uh, you know what? Come to think of it, it's really not over your inn. It's, it's over your barn. <laughs> but you wouldn't be people in your barn, would you? No, not even a pregnant woman. What? Nothing. Keep talking. Well, well listen, you you got to have something for me. See, that's the one of the Well, thank you very much. Merry Christmas to you. Oh, Merry Christmas. Oh, yes, this is huge. It's a big thing to get in here. I mean, it's not common. It's not serious, you know? Why are you going to this trade? Listen. You don't need that a lot. If you follow that star, some type of sign. If it could be a sign, it'd shine usually bright in my barn. But a sign? No, 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 there's just no way. My wife, she would look at the star and she would say, maybe it's a god thing. No, 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 no,
best one you can, child. Do you know what you're just about to begin? Begin the world, I have my mind, so begin my world, too. So, very sense. Not sure so we don't miss this, so we need to talk money and things. It's about. Merry Christmas. Yes. Merry Christmas. on the original language and the context and the customs of the day and what scriptures actually say and they don't say because 
there's oftentimes, you know, we believe things and we've kind of wrapped things and, and we've injected them in, into what we think of, not just with this story, but with all kinds of story. And when you go back and read scripture, particularly if you were to read this, I told my family, I said, if you were just, if the, even like a desert island and the Bible washed up and you had never read it before and you just read it for the first time, there's a lot of the ideas that we carry around in us that we probably wouldn't have because of layers and layers of stories and traditions as we've built into it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you just a little bit about this one, and I'm fine if you don't reach the same conclusion. But when I read this as if I've never, never read it before, but if I study everything about it, there's another scenario that may have played out. And it's one that I believe was very, very likely what could have happened on that night. Now, the typical nativity scene that we're, everybody's familiar with, right? It didn't show up until 800 years ago. That was when, in 1223, somebody had the idea of, hey, let's kind of do a reenactment of what happened that night. And ever since then, we've been doing that. And you see them in people's yards. Uh, maybe it's on your mantle. We'll have one in our house uh, in a week or two. We're going to decorate here, and we'll put one out in the foyer. Uh, they're everywhere. Nativity scenes are, and, and you know, I kind of like that because it at least pulls people back to what this holiday was intended to be about and how it began, which was with Jesus. But everybody's pretty familiar with a nativity scene, and they're all kind of a kind of alike. It's a common saying at Christmas time to say that Jesus Christ was born in a manger. And I get that, and you get that. I don't think he was actually born into the manger, like the second he was born, but, but Mary laid him in a manger and used that. If you're not familiar with what a manger is, uh, the animals typically would eat outdoors, and they'd eat in the field, and they'd be like hay bales or whatever. But when they brought them inside, they needed something smaller, kind of like you would do with your pet. You've got, we've got an outside thing for our dog that the raccoons are attacking every night. We're going to figure that out. And then we've got inside water dish and a, and a you know, bowl of food. And it's the same kind of idea that really simplifies it. But a manger was like an indoor feeding trough. It was a place where the animals could come in out of the weather and away from predators, and they could eat. So... It made a perfect little space to put a child because it's probably got hay in it and it's softer than the you know floor and 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 it's just it kind of fits. He can't roll out of it, so that kind of made sense. So Jesus is born in, in in a manger. That's where Mary laid him in Luke two seven after his birth. And although we don't know the exact location of where Jesus was born, we do know that it was in Bethlehem. We do know that, and we know that there was a manger or a feeding trough there. So these are some of the clues that we began to get. Now, there's a lot of evidence, and it's compelling, uh, that the church in the nativity in Bethlehem was the birthplace of Jesus. The primary area of the church of the grotto of the nativity is uh, there is beneath it a kind of a rectangular cavern which really fits because in that day, sometimes people would build their houses right over a cave because that's like a built-in basement. I mean, we do the same thing, right? I mean, we don't build over a cave, but my house has a basement, and it was just a real handy place to store things, to keep animals, extra food, all of that. The temperature was more consistent down there. So this place in particular... Uh, is where a lot of people think that Jesus was actually born. Did you know there's even a silver star designating the exact location where it was believed that that happened? And they really got that down. And that was back, um, you know, beginning in the 300s and up to about the year 500. Of course, today we have more sophisticated um, ways of you know, like archaeology and some things that we can we can do that maybe help us to to know that better. But a lot of people think that, and like I say, there's a lot of evidence for it. God promised the Savior's virgin birth immediately after mankind's first sin, all the way back in Genesis 3:15. Uh, these prophecies began 
uh, to occur that would talk about the coming Messiah. And then hundreds of years uh, later, the prophet Micah foretold the birth of Jesus in the small town of Bethlehem. He pinpointed, you know, there's like 133 prophecies about Jesus. There's like 600 of them, but there's some that are so specific uh, that there's no wiggle room. And almost all of these are impossible to be manipulated. Jesus couldn't say, okay, I'm going to fake everybody out. I want everybody to think I'm the Christ. So I've got to make these prophecies because the first thing everybody's going to do is go back and check out the prophecies and see if I'm the guy. So I've got to make those match me. So I need to figure out where I'm going to be born. You can't do that, right? you just born wherever your parents are, and that's where you're born. So um, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And here's what Micah 5.2 prophesies. But you... Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. This prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, were called to Bethlehem because of this census. It was a, a national thing. It was a government thing, and everybody had to do it. It was a real pain, but, you know, you, you do what you got to do. So, and it, it had covered the entire Roman territory. Now, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, it describes that. It says, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went down to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was great with child. Now, there's a lot I could say about the prophecy of Jesus coming through the heritage of King David. And it actually occurs on both his adopted father and his mother's side of the family. Both of those lines come straight through from David, fulfilling yet another prophecy. It says, while they were there, the time came for her uh, to give birth. So while they were in Bethlehem, the, the time came. It was the moment for Jesus to be born in verse 6. And because of all the crowds that had come to Bethlehem, and you can imagine how this, how this worked out, uh, there was no room for them anywhere, for Mary and Joseph. In verse 7 it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, which gives us indication that there were other sons, that Jesus had maybe brothers and sisters later, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. It was a custom that they would use strips of soft cloth, and they would wrap the baby up. And some cultures still do this. Um, I've been uh, a couple of dozen times to the Navajo Indian Reservation, and the ladies there still wrap their children up. And it looks uncomfortable, but the kids seem to like it, and they carry them around just like you've seen. You know, that's probably a stereotype of, of how you do that. And I think some mothers are leaning back into that. I know that trends and fads with parenting come and go. Swaddling is cool again. So um, if, if you want to be a good mom, you need to wrap your kids up. And I suggest it all the way up through teenage years, and just, just, to, just to give that a try. So they wrapped Jesus up in these swaddling cloths, and they laid him in this manger, which was a perfect place because it was very practical. There was no place for them in the end. Now, while tradition says that this inn was sort of a hotel, and this is the part where you'll probably want to email me or talk about me at lunch um, because I'm going to break away from what we typically think of sometimes. And I think this story that I've been told ever since I was a little boy, even though I didn't go to church, I could tell you all about where Jesus was born and just how it happened. And then I started reading the Bible, and that kind of changed a little, thing, a little bit. We don't know for sure. It could have been sort of a hotel. They did have these public houses back then. But tradition says that's what it was. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Greek word translated in is kataluma. And, it, and it's almost, in fact, it's always, except for this one spot, translated guest room. In fact, it's only used two other times in Scripture, and both times it refers to the upper room 
where Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper. Now, one thing, if I'm right with where I'm headed with this, it's kind of cool that Jesus' first night on the planet and his last night with his disciples was in the same kind of environment and surrounded by people that he knew. And I'll come back to that idea, that thought later. But anyway, that's how that word is normally translated in other Greek literature outside of Scripture. It's the same thing. Now, there is a Greek word for in, which is kind of like our, sort of like our modern day concept of a hotel, except when you got a room uh, at, a, at an inn, you shared it with other people, <laughs> with strangers. You would go in, and today we're real picky. We go in and we think, well, this, this room isn't clean, or the carpet's shabby, and I want to see another room. Well, back then, you'd go in a room, and there's 12 other people. Hey, what's up? Yeah, come on in. And you just you sleep with these strangers and their kids and their dogs, and, and you think, ah! You know, and that that's just was the environment. So it's a little, it's a, in fact, it's a lot different than what we know now. But anyway, all those rooms were packed full. And it wasn't just, you know, it's just all kinds of people, and they're all there, and that room is full. There is a room, there is a word for that, uh, and, it, and it's uh, pandoshion, which is like, you know, in the account of the Good Samaritan, remember that story? When he finds the guy, and he's beat up, and it says he takes him to a pandoshion. It, it, it's a hotel, it's an inn, and he tells the guy, if you take care of him, I'll pay for it, and I've got money here, I'm going to give you this in advance, and you look after him. The guy's name, the master of the house, is, is a direct uh, title that connects to that place, kind of like the desk clerk or somebody that works there at the place. So he says, you take care of him. That word is used there and in other places when it's talking about a public place. Now, the word used in this gospel account, and this story is recorded in Matthew and in, and in Luke, uh, it refers to, I think, the guest room of a family home. I mean, some of you, maybe a lot of our folks are gone for Thanksgiving, and where do you think they're staying? Some are in hotels, sure. And sometimes when you go to visit family, you stay in a hotel, but almost always we stay in each other's homes. When we go to Mississippi, we stay at my niece's house. When people come to our house, we have a room upstairs, and we call it the guest room. <laughs> and that's where people stay. We get that. You know what? It's not so unusual. They did the exact same thing. It was very common. And Joseph's family was from Bethlehem. So when everybody goes back home, just like wherever you go back to for Thanksgiving or Christmas or, you know, when you travel, you go back to those places, and there's his cousins and, you know, Aunt Mimi and all of these people, and they're all kind of around. And what they would do is they'd build a house, and then maybe somebody would get married, and they want to start. So they would build a room onto the house. It's like Jesus said, told us in, in John 4. He said, you know, I, my father's in my father's house are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. It's the same idea. They would build onto the house, or they would build next door. If there wasn't room, they'd think, well, you know, a couple of houses down, there's an empty lot, so we're going to build there. And we kind of do that. Some of you have family that live kind of around you, and this is where you grew up, and, you know, your kids stay, or your parents don't live that far away. Same thing. I mean, it just, it just kind of makes sense. So they go back, and it, 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 there's this, this home, but it's filled up. All the other relatives and people got there ahead of time, and it, it's, just, it's just packed out. So uh, this leads some people to believe, myself included, um, that there is this house, and the way they would design these homes is this, that on the, the lower room floor, they would have space... And this, would be, this, this actually is a house in Bethlehem, uh, and you see the doorways that go up, and this is kind of a cutaway version, and you can see that people slept and did things upstairs, downstairs. Uh, I can't see really good because of the sun, so I'm going to look over here. Um, but you can see how they did a lot of the, that upstairs, and they would sleep on the roof sometimes. This is probably one of the best ones. But look at that wide doorway and you see to the right there, there's like a pen where they would bring animals in, again, to shelter them from the weather, uh, to make sure other animals or, you know, robbers or what do you call the people who, like cattle rustlers, 
animal robbers. I don't know what they're called. I'm, my mind has gone blank. Thieves. Just, we'll just say that. You get the idea. But anyway, so they would bring them in, and this is what they did. This was so common, and archaeology can, can show you that you know, this is very, very typical uh, for a home. So the idea that I'm kind of sharing with you is that when Mary and Joseph got to this patriarchal home of their relatives and, you know, there's, there's nowhere to stay, and Mary's about to have a baby. Well, they're not going to put her upstairs in this crowded room with Uncle Fred and, oh, my, you know, and all of that. So look at this place. It's, it's right there. It's in the house. It's downstairs right off the courtyard. But there's some privacy you know, it, they, they can be off to themselves just a little bit. And they're used to being around the animals. Some of you grew up in a farming community, or maybe you came from a more rural background, and being around animals just doesn't, you know, well, this was that so much more because it was just a part of their daily life. So, yeah, uh, the the bad part about it, I guess, the negative part is, yeah, she was with the animals and the hay and all of that, and that is not the best environment and idea, especially for birthing, you know, process. But um, the good news is, I think, is that God was so careful to surround Mary and Joseph with family and with friends. That there were people there close by who could help her. And maybe they stayed because, you know, the wise men really didn't show up that night. That's a whole other thing we'll talk about later. But it was, you know, after the fact, and maybe they show up. And do you remember when Herod was going to kill all the babies? And he said, I want everybody two years old and under because he wanted to make sure that he made a big enough loop to get Jesus is what he was trying to do. And he knew he could be as old as two years old. And the wise men show up later, and they said they found Mary at the the house where she was staying. She was staying in the house. So, um, this is kind of the idea, and I know that maybe messes up your Christmas, and you're thinking, I don't want you to fool with my traditions or my stories because I'm kind of romantic about those. Uh, but this is, this is kind of the, the idea. In any case, whether it was at the end and it played out just like the stories you've always heard or whether it's like this version, Jesus was born uh, at night, and he was in some kind of a keeping place for the animals. And after he's delivered, Mary, his mother, wraps him up in these cloths, which was very common, and laid him in a manger, which was not common in uh, verse 7, because there was no place for them. And then, verse 2, verse, excuse me, chapter uh, 2, verse 10 talks about these shepherds. It says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. And you'll find the babe, and he's wrapped up in these swaddling cloths, and he's lying in a manger. That's how you're going to know you've got the right child. You've got the right baby. Now, one of the things I love about this and the idea, uh, and we go back and we look at, you remember the church of the grotto that I mentioned a moment ago, the nativity with the cave and where the star is and, and the medieval, you know, the Catholics kind of deemed that the place under Julius's uh, empire and reign and said, this is, the, this is the spot. What if that is? If it is, do you know that that would have been right in the middle of, of the ancient town of Bethlehem, which again would make perfect sense for that to be where Joseph's family was located. So they're, they're there and they're in that spot. And so the shepherds who would have been accessible, who would have been close by and led to that, would have been the shepherds who were watching over the sacrificial lambs who would be used that were being used for Passover. It was the Passover celebration. And that, so they've gathered these lambs um, to, to sacrifice them. Isn't that, isn't there something about that? Here they are. They're the ones watching over the sacrificial lambs. And they're called to go and to see for themselves the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of all the world. I think there's so much about this that was was purposeful, but that's what happened. 
So why was the Savior and the King of the world born in such a place with, with animals and, uh, you know, and this, this so, so humble? Why was he laid in a, in a feeding trough? I mean, really, uh, God's Son deserved this a high-profile birth in the most elegant of surroundings, but instead, God's own Son made his appearance in the lowliest of circumstances. For me, as I've walked and I've thought, and I've, this humble birth has this amazing message that this transcendent God condescended to come to us. Instead of coming to earth as a pampered, privileged ruler, Jesus was born in meekness as one of us. And as the lowest of us. And for a guy like me, a boy from Fraser in North Memphis, this makes him so approachable and accessible and available. He's one of us. There are no palace gates to bar the way to him. There's no ring of guards. There's no security. Nothing that prevents our approach. The king of kings came humbly and his first bed was a manger. So wherever you're from, whatever your background is, we can identify with you. I also think that this Christmas narrative, especially if you believe the idea that... um, they were surrounded by Joseph's family, to me, demonstrates the importance and the significance of our biological and our spiritual families. You have been our spiritual family for three decades. And we are much closer to many of you than we are our own flesh and blood family. And those who are still living from our family, we're, we're getting to the, to the, the top of the, the ladder now. Um, you know, we're all three, four hundred miles away. But there's something ab- about this. I, I, I believe that the Christian life is not one of isolation. That is, in a sense, what church is really all about. It's what family is all about, especially during the holiday season. We're reminded of the significance of relationships and the connection that we have with one another. So even if you're not able to go home, call your mama. (laughs) Send a card. There's something about this time, I think, that's just wired in. It's built into to remind us that, that uh, that reaching to one another is what's important and what's special about this. Now, we can get, I know I have become so many times distracted by outside pressures during Christmas season. And there have been times, and I actually said this, and it wasn't that many years ago, going into it, and there's so much going on, and and I say something like, you know, I just wish this were done. I just can't, I just want to get all this over with, and I don't. And when, when Kathy comes in and says, or it's Thanksgiving's over, put the tree up. I want the tree up. But where's the tree? It's in the basement where I threw it over that old treadmill. And I think, oh, I don't want to go down there and get it. And it's all tangled up and it breaks apart into three or four pieces. And I think, I don't, and, you know, and all the stuff that goes on can, can pull you away from what it's about. And once it's up and it's lit, I think, oh, that's beautiful. I'm so glad, you know, that we, we've got this and do that. But we lose the meaning and the worship during this time. And some of you are already ready for this to be over. You're already done. You're not looking forward to it. And we lose connections because of all the distractions. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something, and then I'm going to give you maybe a couple of ideas. Uh, but if you've got one of our handouts today, or if you've got a sheet of paper, or you've got an app in your phone that'll let you do it, just take out a sheet of paper, whatever, journal. And, and I, I want you just to write down your top three 
distractions or stressors, things that really stress you about the holidays during this season. And I want you to take time to do this because in just a moment at the end of our service, we're going to pray over these. We're going to pray for each other. Now, here's some I thought about uh, last night. Um, I just I wrote some of these down. Things that might distract you. Uh, Tennessee football. That's, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to say. Um, we're winning at life, but we are not winning at football. Okay, Tennessee football, gift buying, traveling with children, awkward family relationships. I know some of you think, I don't have, I can't, I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, the end of the year deadlines at work or school, you're trying to get it wrapped up, you're trying to finish the budget, whatever it is. Financial pressures. You're going into Christmas and you're thinking, ah, you know, I can't do this. Uh, health problems. You think, oh, what a time to be sick or to be ill or to have some kind of a uh, problem. Uh, loss of loved ones. Sometimes that happens. You know, Kathy's mom died on Thanksgiving morning and it changed that whole day for us. Now, in years since, we've you know, it's a sweet memory. It's a, it's a thing where, but some of you, you're fresh, maybe walking away from something like that, and it, and it hurts. Or it's your first holiday to be without somebody at the table. I know. Or maybe you just got a busy schedule and pressure, and now you're adding in Christmas parties and socials and this event. you got to go do that. And you're helping out with charity, and, you know, you're, you're going over here to do these things. It, it just it can be a lot of pressure. Now, let me just run through real quickly just some tips on how to prevent holiday uh, stress and depression. And some of these I came up with. Some I just went on and looked at like Mayo Clinic. I think, oh, they've got some good ideas. And uh, here's just some ideas. Acknowledge your feelings. Just be upfront about that. If anybody close to you has recently died or you can't be with your loved ones, if you're away somewhere because of maybe in the military or a business or something like that, it's okay to feel sad and, you know, that's all right. That's pretty normal. It's okay to cry or whatever you want to do. Secondly, reach out. If you feel isolated, if you feel kind of lonesome during this time, um, seek out community. That's what church is for. Be here, be here next Sunday night for, for, the, for the singing. Be here the next Sunday night after that to hear the kids sing, uh, particularly those of you who are never around children. You know, there, there are things you can do. Uh, just to, that's, I'm just saying to support that kind of uh, companionship, volunteering your time to help others, getting involved, uh, to reach out. Be realistic. Uh, the holidays don't have to be perfect uh, or, or just like last year or just like the one you had when you were six years old and everything's got to work out just like that. You know, and I know it's, it's kind of nostalgic and we kind of wish it was like that. Pick a few traditions to hold on to, but be open to change. Uh, be open to change with your family as your kids grow up. And uh, they're, they decided to go to Hawaii for Christmas, and they didn't invite you. Well, I'm sorry. Go see a movie. FaceTime them. Skype them. Give them a call. I mean, it's okay. Don't freak out because you can't hold all your traditions. You know, just sort of make some new ones and figure out ways to celebrate. Set aside your differences. Ah, be willing to accept family members and friends just for who they are, and you've only got to be around them one day. And <laughs> I know, I know that sometimes it's so much fun. You miss people so much you want to see them, and sometimes you're with them about 15, 20 minutes, and you think, oh, this is why I live 400 miles away from you. So no, I'm just, I just picked that number. I didn't mean to uh, say, but set aside grievances, and you can talk about that all later. Stick to a budget. Oh, my goodness. You know, you see that, you think, I'm going to get that, and I'm going to get that, and I'm going to get that. I kid because my, my grandson just had his third birthday, and so he gets gifts, and now Christmas is coming up, and he's going get, to get more gifts. And I said, he's got more things by age, by age three than I got my entire childhood. <laughs> and I think that's true for a lot of us, and we want to do that. I'm already, I'm going to give him more than I, I ever had for my entire childhood. His parents don't know, and I appreciate you not saying anything to them. They're down in kids' stuff. Um, but I was kidding, and I said, well, on my third birthday, my mom gave me a puff of her cigarette and a new stick. So things have changed, and if you're not careful, you'll blow your whole budget. So stick to your budget, okay? Plan ahead. 
Try to do your shopping and baking. Kathy's really smart. She does like one dish a, a day leading up to Thanksgiving, and boom, it's done. You know, so uh, do that. Learn to say no. You don't have to say yes to every event and everything that people want you to do. You're going to feel overwhelmed. Don't abandon health and healthy habits. It's okay to have a couple of big meals and have fun with that. But there's something in me that says, well, it's the holidays. I got to eat like crazy every day, whatever I want, and as much of it as I want. And I think, it's the holidays. What am I supposed to do? You know, well, that's not, you, you can't do that. Take a breather. Take some time for yourself. Don't just go from thing to thing. And then, let me just throw this in. to see If you get to a place, uh, I had a cousin who committed suicide on Christmas Day, and I was so mad at him. For that, I mean, I was sad, but I was so mad because his parents are grieving. And I thought, you have forever changed this day for our whole family. And I'll never forget that Christmas. I'll never forget that, being at my grandparents' house and getting the news and how it just, you know, and I, I just wondered, how did he get to that place of despair? Don't get to that place. Don't get anywhere near that place. It's okay to talk to a friend or somebody you trust or even somebody, a professional. Okay, you got those lists that you made? You know, I love the fact that, that God came to these shepherds. And sometimes you think, why didn't the angels announce it to the important religious leaders of the day? All the, all the important political people with their expectations. I think because it was a crazy election year. <laughs> And they were just so tired. And they said, you know what? We're not going to anybody that has anything to do with politics. We're just going to ordinary folks. I'm kind of kidding about that. But I love that he made room for me. And that he made room for you. And that he involved these ordinary people like shepherds who were not distracted by all of that. This innkeeper, whoever he was, if he even existed, missed the Messiah on the night of his birth. I don't want you to miss this. So how are our expectations, and sometimes we get really legalistic about that, how is that blinding us to how God wants to work and move in your life during this season? such a beautiful time and such a beautiful event. Don't miss it. So let's do this. I ask you to write down some of the things that stress you or that just really distract you from Christmas. You've lived enough Christmases now that you know this is what's kind of how it's going to work. But let's pray over those together. And that's how we're going to close out this service. So you can do this right where you are. Or you can bring those up and just put them in front of you on these steps and we'll just use this as an altar. And in just a couple of moments, I'm going to pray out loud for us and that'll wrap up our time together. Okay, would you stand with me? And let's pray. If you hadn't had a chance to write those down, you can do it now. If you want to stay where you are, if you'd like to bring them up here and just kneel and pray, absolutely, you're welcome. Please come do that.